Hi everyone, and welcome to the Illustration Department Podcast. I am your host, Giuseppe Castellano. In this podcast, I talk to folks in illustration, animation, and other creative fields about their beginnings, their successes, and the bumps and bruises they've experienced along the way. In this episode, I talk to art director and illustrator, Crystal Lauk. In the early days of Dropbox, a customer service employee drew silly doodles for their blog posts. Those doodles were the beginning of an illustration boom in the tech industry. Among other topics, Crystal talks about what it's like to illustrate for tech companies. We discuss how empathy is at the center of user experience. And Crystal explains how illustrators can look west for their next client. I hope you enjoy our conversation. There are a lot of things that illustrators need to worry about. Uh, you know, getting work and uh, sort of emotional stability, you know, dealing with rejection and that kind of thing. Um, but physical well-being is one of those things that uh, falls down the line of priorities, I think, with illustrators. Like they're, they're willing to, you know, not go to bed until three in the morning and eat really poorly and not take care of themselves and not walk around or, you know, stop staring at their screen after four hours. Is that oh something that, is that something that yeah. you have to that you've dealt with? Yeah, exactly. Especially, I think, you know, getting a little older, you start noticing these things a little bit more. And uh, a lot of my illustrator friends, too, are kind of all on the same wavelength where we're like, God, my, my back and my neck and my shoulders, like, what's going on? <laughs> so, yeah, we have to, like, make a pact and be like, OK, let's, you know, actually do some exercise, get out from the desk, you know, mm-hmm. for once in a while. Yeah. I actually um, do these uh, do these little events at my house, like, every month or so called Drink Not Draw. And it's just a chance, like, OK, get out of your desk. So, mm-hmm. like, let's just all socialize and talk mm-hmm. shop and uh, hang out. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, in addition to all the things that illustrators have to deal with uh, these days, their bodies falling apart is one of them. And it's like, oh, gosh, I have to worry about that now, too. My wrist, you know, this is, I need my (laughs) wrist. I need my back, you know. Yeah, yeah, Uh, exactly. Yeah. So um, I want to, we're going to talk about all the work that you've done that um, causes your body to fall apart. <laughs> but before that, so um, tell me a little bit about where you come from. Are you? I understand you're from Arizona is that originally. Is that right? Yes, Arizona. I like to joke a little bit, and no offense to all the Arizona Arizonians out there, but it could be a little bit of a cultural wasteland, especially a little town called Gilbert, Arizona. It was mm-hmm. once the fastest growing suburb in America before the recession hit. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> that's mm-hmm. where I'm from. Um, ever since I can remember, I dreamed of California. Like mm-hmm. this was the place. This is where I needed to be. Mm-hmm. So now I'm here. How did your family end up in Arizona? So they're actually both from Portland, Oregon. And my dad just got a job out there. They love Arizona. They're very conservative Christians. So it makes sense for them. Mm-hmm. How did your parents meet? So they met in community college. My mom immigrated here when she was 17, and she's a Korean. Mm-hmm. And uh, my dad is a white guy <laughs> with German <laughs> roots. And, you know, they had a really difficult interracial relationship. My grandfather was, like, really against their marriage um, and eventually, like, warmed up to it. And so... Which grandfather? Oh, from my mom's side. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Lauk is German. Is that is that correct? It, I guess it's sort of German. <laughs> it's kind of a weird story. My dad's family lived in Poland for a really long time, and it's, it's we're not, we're pretty sure that we're German ethnicity, mm-hmm. um, but I think there might be some Polish in there. My the grandfather was, the household was started to um, kind of speak German just because of World War II. And um, but my grandfather moved to Germany um, during the war as a carpenter. They say that the name got 
change to sound a little bit more dramatic. And I don't know what the previous one is. It's mm-hmm. all kind of like a weird story that doesn't make sense. <laughs> uh, so we kind of looked it up and it's like, Lauk, it says that Lauk is a little bit more like Finnish. So I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you're, you're growing up in Arizona. I'm going to go ahead and just assume that art was part of your childhood. Uh, that's a question yeah. that I hear a lot of. And it's like, you know, when did you start drawing? And the answer is almost always when I was a kid. So let's just mm-hmm. skip that and uh, fast forward into your teen years. Like, did you, were there other artists? Like, when did you realize uh, that illustration was actually a thing? And were there, was there an artist or two that um, sort of opened your eyes to that? Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, I was drawing ever since I was a kid. And especially as a teenager, um, drawing was like this really cathartic thing for me. I think I was going through a lot of tough times. And it was just the, the you know, that really expressive thing that just got all the emotions out, right? Mm-hmm. And um, I think since I can remember, the biggest inspiration for me was... James Jean. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think I like owe it all to him because that was the first instance where I looked at his work and I was like, I could, I could do this. Like, mm-hmm. I know, I know when an illustrator is now, and I want to do exactly what he's doing. Yep. And this was before, you know, he he's a he's more of a fine art artist now. Mm-hmm. But back in the day, he was doing a lot of illustrations for Target mm-hmm. and um, you know different things like that, as well as comic books. And um, yeah, his sketchbooks are mind blowing. I mean, I've never seen anyone do what he has done with a pen, just a pen. Oh, it's just, it's so good. Yeah, it's so good. <laughs> so there's beautiful. actually, did you know that there's a, a, there's a James Jean pen? I heard about this. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, it's called the SKB, uh, something like the SKB 1000 or the SKB SB 1000 or something like that. <laughs> And it's this ballpoint pen that he used. And I think he, you know, he posted it online or it's a a video that he's recorded or something like that. Right. A blog maybe. And anyway, so I went out and bought one of those. This is around 2010 or so. Like he, he was posting a lot of that, those like pen drawings. So I went out and bought one because I'm like, well, I feel like if I'm using the same pen as James Jean, my illustrations will just improve. uh, Totally. Right. It's built in. It's built in. (laughs) Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm sorry to report that my drawings did not improve whatsoever. Oh, it doesn't look exactly like James Jean. Not even close. Shock. Yeah, total, <laughs> total shocker. Well, I think back in the day uh, when I was a teenager, you know, pouring over James Jean stuff. I mean, like, I remember even printing out, like, James Jean <laughs> artwork on, like, a really old black and white, like, dot matrix printer. <laughs> <laughs> um and, and and so I could just like flip through them and like research on them and yep. stuff. Uh, my parents were really strict about having a computer, so everything was very analog for me for a little while. But yeah. Mm-hmm. So you moved forward. Uh, through, you know, your James Jean is is uh, sort of triggered something inside of you. Did you go out and get your degree in art? I really, really wanted to go to Pasadena Art Center. Right, that was my dream school. And I had this boyfriend at the time in high school that my parents really, really hated. And they were like, <laughs> you can go to Art Center if you break up with Kyle. And of course, like being the stubborn, like rebellious teenager. And I didn't believe them anyways. I didn't believe that they would send me to this school anyway. So I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so I ended up going to Arizona State University instead mm-hmm. <laughs> with a major in painting. Okay. <laughs> Um, and a minor in English literature. And I think like a couple of years in, I was like, man, this isn't working for me. What the hell am I going to do with a painting to create ASU? Mm-hmm. So my boyfriend at that time came from San Francisco and he wanted nothing more than to go back. So he, he took me there and we went on a few road trips to San Francisco and I absolutely fell in love. One day when we were kind of like walking around the city, there was a spring show for um, the Academy of Art, and we walked in, and I was blown away by the artwork. I thought, oh, this is really cool. I researched more into the school, and it was like half the price <laughs> of Art Center. It just like all made sense to me 
that day in like some cafe in San Francisco. Like mm. this is this is it. Yeah. I'm I'm gonna go to school <laughs> and I'm gonna live in this city and it's gonna be great. And it took a really long time to get there. And of course, like, oh gosh, my parents didn't even know that I moved um, <laughs> to San Francisco. I even, um, oh gosh, talk about commitment. Um, I married that boyfriend mm -hmm. so I can get financial aid for school. I know that's, that's a crazy, don't do that kids, don't do that. But I guess it got me, it eventually got me into school and graduating, so. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so you went to the Academy <laughs> of Art in uh, San Francisco. And uh, what were your first professional <laughs> steps? It took me a really, really long time to get through a school. I just want to just want to say that for like all the kids out there who are like really struggling because I had to work full time and I was going to school full time and then that got to be too much. So ended up going to school for half time and then not going to school at all for a couple of years. And so it was it was kind of a rocky road. But during my last year of school, a friend introduced me to a boutique digital agency. Mm -hmm. He was friends with the owner and they kind of sweet talked into, you know, getting me an internship there and uh, doing <laughs> UI UX design. Mm -hmm. Did you know anything about UI UX design? I didn't even know anything about digital art. I didn't even know anything about Adobe Creative Suite. <laughs> did you, uh, uh, and let me remind you, I'm recording this. Did you yeah. lie your way into that job? No, uh-uh. No, they, they, they knew that, okay. I mean, here was this, like, <laughs> I was really into, like, oil painting and watercolor mm -hmm. and pen and ink. I, I didn't, yeah, I didn't know anything digitally, but they were like, cool, we'll just have her, like, you know help us out and i ended up just like i was like now's my chance and so i just i worked really hard and i picked up things really quickly and so in a couple of months they uh, gave me a job that experience like there was a lot of issues with it um it was kind of a crazy environment but i loved that i kind of got that agency experience under my belt um and mm -hmm. learned how an agency works mm -hmm. And that's kind of helping me out now when I'm trying to, you know, trying to start a little bit of an agency of my own. Mm -hmm. well, just going back really quickly uh, yeah. to UI UX. So mm -hmm. user interaction, user experience. Yeah. And um, there's really uh, sort of two components, two main components to it. Uh, this is my understanding. Please correct me if I'm wrong. But one is obviously the technical part of it. So knowing how mm -hmm. to... to design a website and to, you know, uh, create an interface that, uh, you know, for, that's consumer facing and that will, um, invite folks in and then keep them in and not have them bounce out. You want them to not be frustrated uh, yeah, uh, fr exactly, with that experience. Exactly. Um, it's a lot like walking into a, a nice store on the, you know, a boutique store of some kind. Uh, one store is, is very organized and pleasant and it smells nice and the music is nice. And so it's, you walk in and you want to stay in for a while and Hey, you might actually buy something. Yeah. Yeah. The goal is basically that environment, but in a digital setting. And then the opposite of that is, you know, walking into a store and it's a, it's a, it's just a hot mess. Not yeah. organized. The, the employees are rude and you, and you bounce, you just bounce right out. Oh, we all know what those websites look like. Exactly. Um, <laughs> so, you know, and so that's one end of UI UX and the other side is the sort of philosophical part. And this is something that I think illustrators should know about. And that is mm -hmm. um, when it comes to visual solutions, my feeling is that it's um, the goals are the same, whether it, whether it's children's book illustration, whether it's branding for a tech company, um, I feel like the goals are the same. And that is um, empathy for the user. Yeah, I actually just I just attended a talk yesterday called Empathy and Design. Oh. <laughs> and it was pretty <laughs> yeah, coincidental. Um go. but that's like a big that's a big word for me because I feel like that's the power of illustration mm -hmm. is to bring on that empathy. And mm -hmm. you know, it's really cool to hear from, you know, what does empathy look like to product designers or mm -hmm. brand designers or illustrators? You know, we're all kind of like having that goal in mind. The other goal I think is um is taking sort of complex information and and presenting it in a clear way. Yeah. Which sounds, and if an illustrator is listening to this, I mean, that sounds, oh, like that sounds familiar. 
So I guess I'm saying all of this uh, to lower folks' anxiety levels a little bit when they hear UI UX. Yeah, exactly. You know, that experience really informed, um, you know, my career going forward. It's like, oh, wow, okay, this is the thing. And I could easily see how illustration could fit really well into, um, you know, into the interface, right? Mm -hmm. Into um, helping people, you know, move forward in an onboarding flow. (laughs) You mentioned that you're creating your own agency, you not creating your you created your own agency crystal Lauk studios mm-hmm. you're taking your first steps professionally and then you decide you know what i'm going to create my own agency i'm going to create my own studio uh what kind of led to that and uh what were your experiences your early experiences with it that's something that i decided to do like about a year ago i was kind of looking around and i think the interesting thing about illustration and tech is that it's more um, it's more centered around branding. So when you think of like editorial illustration, you know, it doesn't have to have a lot of boundaries, you know, stylistically, or it could be it could really be anything, right? That fit suits like the subject. But when you think of illustration for companies, it needs to fit in a certain identity within it, and have a kind of um, you know, like a ethos code, like a, a, a value system to mm-hmm. it. And it needs to be systematic. I thought maybe, okay, I'm like onto something doing more of an illustration agency where, you know, if you are doing branding illustrations and you have illustrators that are very versatile and can fit in a lot of different styles, um, you know, then that works. So that's kind of why I'm, I'm kind of trying to grow that out. And you've had clients. Uh, I mean, Google is one of your mm. was one of your clients. Um, mm-hmm. uh, Thumbtack, Uber. Mm-hmm. How, how do you, in, you know, in the in the children's books? So when I when I was going through college, uh, you know, with an illustration degree, we were told here is how we were just at that time. Obviously, there were no no, no such thing as tech companies uh, that were hiring illustrators, anyways. And yeah. so it was really just three kind of. Um, directions three applications for your art children's books or you know children's publishing or just publishing in general editorial Mm -hmm. work and uh you know like tabletop you know board games and cards and that kind of thing sure yeah and now now it's it's so much more it's so much more so how did you how do you connect with these tech companies how do you reach out to them how do you how do you uh, uh get them to hire you and and get them to to approach your studio things just kind of came together in a really serendipitous way. I mean, going to school, even going to Academy of Art, I had no idea what I was, why I thought that I wanted to do editorial illustration by having that foray into the digital agency. And then my, my boyfriend at the time, now husband was a, uh, a startup guy. <laughs> he was the co-founder of a startup. Um, and so he kind of introduced me to this whole world you know how it is, like one thing leads to another and it's Mm -hmm. all about network. It Mm -hmm. is all about network and referrals and that's really how I've been able to grow my business. Right, when it comes to tech, the tech industry and its relationship with illustration, this is a fairly newish relationship that that they're having at the moment. I mean, I remember in the early 2000s, those early Dropbox illustrations uh, that were just (laughs) sort of really silly and so I was reading about that and yeah. uh, it turned out that it's really just, it was a, it was a, you know, John Ying who, who bought uh, some colored pencils and some pens and created these little doodles. And he wasn't even, he wasn't a non-staff illustrator. They couldn't afford illustration. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, he just created these doodles and would post them on their blog and that kind of thing. And they were just super silly. Like one was of a Tyrannosaurus Rex and another one was of a Phoenix. And by yeah. the way, this is for Dropbox and he's in customer service, but he's doing these things. And what ended up happening, interestingly, was that the customers reacted positively to these illustrations. Even exactly. folks who downgraded their subscription, the email they would get, the response they would get from Dropbox was like, you know, we're so sorry to see you go with a little illustration. And the illustration was of a computer crying. And the, the, some of these folks would write back and say, oh gosh, I'm so sorry, we hurt your feelings. And some of them would actually go back to upgrading their service with Dropbox. So all of a sudden, an illustration was proving 
uh, to be a financially yeah. relevant yeah. situation. And so, so anyways, so this is only... Sounds like you, is, you read my friend uh, Michael Jetter's uh, blog I did. post. I did, yeah. I did. It was a great... And I'm going <laughs> to post that. I'm going to post that certainly in the show notes because uh, I think yeah. it's worth reading for sure. So for any oh, illustrator, it doesn't... Yeah. You know. it's, that, that, that post is kind of like a... Uh, a little bit of a Bible. <laughs> yeah, a little mind blowing. And yeah. it's, it's it's so funny because there was a there wasn't it wasn't uh, easy either. There was a little bit of corporate mm-hmm. friction. Uh, should we post these illustrations? Should we not? Uh, and anyway, so Mike, here's my question. Nowadays, there are a lot of startups and tech companies approaching mm-hmm. illustration for branding purposes. Why do you think that is? Do you think I feel like there's a little bit of an explosion happening, which is obviously a good thing. Um, but why? Why are tech companies now now turning their attention squarely onto illustration? Well, I think one is really to differentiate themselves. You know, it's a it's kind of a loud market, and um, <laughs> which is a little ironic because you're kind of finding these trends where one tech company wants to differentiate, so now they, you know, try this hand-drawn, you know, black and white editorial style, and then now this swath of tech companies, like, follow suit, and so it's kind of crazy to see all these, like, trends going on. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that's one. And then for two, because it's become kind of a necessary thing. Um, I, You know, I think this is my theory, is, you know, back in the day, you know, it was all about you know, okay, how do we get the user experience right? And, you know, like, especially at the time that I was building websites, I think it was still like breaking new ground. And we've kind of reached that point where like, we've broken that ground. And uh, web designers know exactly what works. And, you know, it's becoming a lot more of an established thing. And so now it's like, wow, okay, now how do we bring in, you know, the emotive aspect to it? You know, how do we remove a lot of those frustrations? And how do we make this more of a kind of, you know, speaking to humans, (laughs) Uh, which is kind of a big, you know, technology problem to have. So illustration, I think, has just been the answer. Mm -hmm. So when clients are approaching you, Mm -hmm. um, they're not just coming to you with a, a brief that's, something along the lines of, can you just draw a really cute bunny? No. They're saying to you, you need to illustrate a concept. Yeah. Like life's a project is one concept. And another one mm-hmm. is like systemizing the approval process. Yeah. And so, <laughs> you know, that's high concept. And so, you know, and oh, by the way, not only do you have to solve uh, this problem visually, you know, life's a project, illustrate that. And let's, you know what, let's give our listeners one couple seconds to think about how would you illustrate life's a project it's difficult right so so yeah totally so how do you approach it like what's your process i think it really kind of leans on um the the powerful tools that illustrators have i mean that's the power of illustration is to have this limitless world right where um you know, you use these things that are are metaphors and they connect to one another. And I think, you know, the thing that I specifically love about tech illustration or, you know, what I do is like, I know there's a lot of illustrators out there who, you know, can render to the nines and I really appreciate that. And I think it's amazing, but there's a certain amount of freedom to having things really simple. Um, that's necessary, especially in tech. You know, when you think of life's a project, so that was um, that was the project that I did for Thumbtack, where I created an illustration style for them, and that was pretty much their their motto. And you know, when I started thinking about projects, I started thinking about the process of projects. I kind of broke it down into it's kind of like a balancing act. That kind of led to the style of all these shapes like precariously stacked on each other almost like um carns you know at any moment it can kind of topple over and things might go like a little you know crazy but it always kind of like straightens out and you know works out in the end how do you negotiate your vision with the vision of the client or you know the style that the client is is hoping to get you know i'm sure there's a little bit of back and forth push and pull how do you how do you manage that 
with most projects, and I think a lot of illustrators will find this familiar, I introduce a lot of different kind of concepts that are that are different from each other. You know, we'll have a good discussion about which one works and which one doesn't. And I think I think the most important thing is I might be really you know married to a certain concept, but if it doesn't communicate very well you know, to, to the client, if it's something that like, oh, I don't really get it, doesn't really make sense to me, I need to check in with myself and say like, okay, if it doesn't work for them, then it might not work for, you know, <laughs> that person who's trying to use this product mm -hmm. and trying to understand this thing, you know, in, you know, Missouri or whatever. Right. Like, you have to make sure that, that, it, that it works and makes sense to everybody. Another layer, another complication to, to this is that in many of these cases, I don't know, I'm thinking of like Google, like the larger mm -hmm. ones, um, mm -hmm. whatever it is that they're commissioning has to appeal in a global market. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So the work that I did, um, I was an illustrator on the Google Play team for uh, almost a couple of years. So we we had to create illustrations for tons of different markets um, for, you know, APAC, that's Asia Pacific. And, European market and um, South America and it's all over the place. You know, thankfully we had different merchandisers in all of those countries that can kind of give us cultural cues to be sensitive of. You know, I'll give you one example. I was creating, I think it was a Lunar New Year um, campaign for South Korea. And I thought, you know, oh, here's the sun and it's got some rays. <laughs> And I, and I, and, you know, I presented it to, um, to the South Korea team and they're like, oh no, 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 <laughs> we can't have that sun. That reminds us of, you know, the, the Japanese, mm -hmm. <laughs> everything going on with Japan and Korea back in the day. And so like, okay, good, good to know. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, you have to be really sensitive to a lot of those things. Yeah, definitely changing gears a little bit not really uh i mentioned google a few times and, and you worked at google play you know the google doodles um you know that has been i think a pretty fantastic thing it's it's actually two sides of one coin so on one end it's it's pretty fantastic they're hiring illustrators and you're seeing these really gorgeous uh you know google doodles mm -hmm. and you would assume that that would help the illustrator find other work it would really like showcase that illustrator on the other side of the coin, though, it's incredibly difficult to find out who illustrated it. Yeah. I don't understand why that is. I mean, I do understand why that is, I suppose. But, the, you know, it, you click on it and it takes several clicks to find and a little bit of you know, Google searching, which, I, you know, is probably what they want uh, to, to find out who the illustrator is. I, I just don't understand that why that is. And to be completely honest, I mean, this is a kind of a beef, a big beef that I have with the industry as well. I don't understand it, to be honest. I don't understand why they can't cr credit illustrators. You know, we're, we're all better for it. It's frustrating because um, I've had work that I was really proud of, you know, for really big clients and nobody can see them mm -hmm. because I can't, I can't put my name on it for fear of um oh gosh what is it there's a clause in the contract of mm -hmm. of um you know being harmful to the company this is before that art goes public or for in perpetuity i've always understood that when an art artwork becomes public then you could show it that's sort of been in the case where like at least I can have it on my portfolio it's not like they're going to credit me you know straight away on the website and stuff like I'm not asking for that but there have been times when um even if it is public it was some kind of clause in the contract or they had a beef with it where you know I I wasn't able to put it on my portfolio mm -hmm. um this sounds very familiar these issues oh, that doesn't yeah. it doesn't matter what the industry is these the issue of crediting artists is universal. I don't understand it. And I wish there was, you know, I don't know, some kind of uprise. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that was an issue in the children's book industry too. Tell yeah. me more about that. Yeah. Less so, less so for sure. Mm. Um, but it depends. It really all depends on the publisher, the, the imprint all the way down to the designer, uh, even down to the author, you know, sometimes they won't want the illustrator's name on the front of the book. 
oh, even gosh. though the illustrator is responsible for the entire you know, sort of visualization of the story, uh, the illustrator's wow. name will get relegated to a copyright page or a little, you know, three point sized uh, line on the back cover, that sort of thing. But hey, at least they're credited. Whereas with the with what I've seen in tech, mm-hmm. uh, I never ever see it uh, artist's name, and not not to say that that's never happened. It's just I haven't. My personal experience is I just haven't seen artists being credited for any for any of it. And there's an illustration boom over there, and you'd think. Um, and uh, what ends up happening is that folks are paying attention, folks who are art buyers in other industries, and it's mm-hmm. difficult for them to find these artists. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I was speaking to a potential client yesterday. It was like, it is so hard to find you guys. <laughs> and I was like, that's why I just reach out a lot. <laughs> uh, I don't know whether to laugh or cry about over that. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, I mean, when I, oh gosh, when I did work for like Fast Company and New York Times, like, it was such a, it felt so good, you know, mm-hmm. to have that article, like go live and just have your name like right there. Like, yeah. Oh <laughs> yeah. That's one of the better things about Feels being right. an illustrator is like when, once you see your work, um, printed or up online somewhere mm-hmm. and you look at it and you're like, that's my piece, that is my piece. And people yeah. are looking at it. It could be, uh, you know, a couple dozen people cause it's a small blog or it could be millions of people. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's wild. And, yeah, and uh, yeah, there's an cool. illustration that, uh, complements and augments the article and allows the the non-visually inclined to um fully i guess experience the what the, the gist of the article it's it's a it's a guide you know that that works in tandem with uh you know with design and and writing yep we've been talking a lot about the tech industry and its relationship with illustration in a positive light and a lot of it is positive but we should talk a little bit about some of these larger tech companies and uh, the criticism they've they've received for you know below board cultures and mm-hmm. corporate cultures and practices. Mm-hmm. So how do you balance? Because a lot of them are your are clients, you know, especially for a, you know a studio like your own. How do you balance your moral compass with needing to pay the bills? <laughs> yeah. That's a good one. Um, oh, so, you know, the majority of, of companies that I've worked for, especially a lot of the startups around here, you know, they're just trying to make a difference in the, in the world. And they're so, um, I think startup culture especially can be a very enthusiastic, uh, really positive space where you know everyone's hustling like under this one dream right and like for thumbtack for example um you know they were really incredible and i you know got the opportunity to work on site with them um for a while on that project i got to learn you know the team and the culture and it was that was really great and you know i've had really great experiences with a lot of um companies i will say this when i was working at google um, I was not an employee. I was a temp worker um, under a staffing agency for Google. <laughs> and so <laughs> if that sounds confusing, it's because it is, but that's over 50% of the workforce um, at Google is um, under this kind of situation. And, uh, you know, I was told oh, you know, if they really like you, whatever, um, then, you know, like, then the position could turn into a full-time position. And, you know, of course, like, more than anything, like, yeah, I want to, you know, I want to be an actual employee of Google. Um, But that was not, that was not the case, because my role as an illustrator was just slated to be a temp worker role, even though I was on the outside doing everything else that an employee uh would be would be would be doing i just didn't have the benefits <laughs> i didn't have the health benefits or the stock options or any of the mm-hmm. perks that uh you know that the google employees have right mm. to be fair uh you know google is still finding a way to uh, you know make some money once they do then maybe they'll bring on some more full-time employees that was a sarcastic comment right <laughs> 
we'll, we'll let the uh, we'll let our listeners. I decide. mean, it just it just felt my career was you know in this weird position, right? And I fought really hard to try to um, to be an employee to you know become an employee. I thought you know okay, meritocracy wins in that game. It doesn't. I think it just became a really difficult, toxic environment. Um, you know, it's interesting because when I left, a whole swath of articles from like the, the New York Times and the Washington Post all came out about the mistreatment of um, mm-hmm. of, uh, of temp workers there. Mm-hmm. So, and you know, at the same time, you as, as an illustrator, it's like it's it is something that you can certainly say. Oh gosh, I worked at Google, and and it's, and people are like, oh really? You know, and especially folks who again aren't aren't uh, you know maybe family members. They're like, what do you do? I'm an illustrator. What's that? Oh, oh yeah, my mom know, wasn't I, truly proud of me until I worked at Google. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So, in addition to everything that we've talked about, you know, reaching out to the clients and and always networking and and making these connections, what else do you feel like you need to do? And I think this is sort of a, under the umbrella of for any illustrator. It's my view and, and and the view of many others that illustrators are, or freelancers, not just illustrators, but freelancers are <laughs> small businesses. And yeah, uh, yeah. You have to sort of act, act the part. So as a, yeah. as someone who runs, you know, your own agency, and uh, you know, thinking about things like staffing and and uh, scaling, how how do you how do you negotiate that as well? By the way, you have to draw and paint on the side and uh, sleep and eat. It feels like more and more days. I feel more like a business person rather than an illustrator. Um, and you kind of have to play in these both worlds, and you kind of have to be super crafty too and think you know for example i intended a branding conference where agencies came in and you know talked about the branding um projects they did for clients i was like okay i want to work with i want to work with those agencies you know so i took all their contact information and emailed them and um you know and so you kind of constantly have to be crafty like that you know, how do you get your next meal (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, kind of mentality? Um, That's kind of what it's all about. Yeah. And the, and the advice um, here that I'm, I'm sort of gleaning is it doesn't, if you start, just start, you know, like even if you're starting small, even if you're doing a logo for your sister, just do a logo for your sister. And then the next one is you do, you know, you're doing a spot illustration for your friend and then you're doing you know, some illustrations for someone's blog. And then it just kind of Mm -hmm. takes these incremental steps, but they, they matter all of, all of these experiences, even the logo for your sister. Absolutely. It makes, it makes a difference. And your sister, you know, I don't know if she maybe runs, it runs a cafe and it was a logo for a cafe and some, you know, somebody walks in and sees that logo. And there's always like those kind of ways to make connections Mm -hmm. to, you know, new potential clients and, um, and I, I, and you, and you, know, you, I'm sure you agree with this. Uh, it's frustrating to, to hear someone say, do a logo for your sister. And then you, who knows, who knows what might happen. And, and these are the people are listening to this thinking like, well, I, I need to pay my bills. I need to raise my family. I yeah. need to afford a home. And they're hearing, and this isn't just from us, but they're also hearing from other sources. Uh, that it's a whole lot of like, just do it and put it up somewhere. And, and then, you know, who knows what happens? And that's not, that to me doesn't sound a lot like a viable career path. Uh, I think you always kind of have to like weigh up the pros and cons, you, you mm-hmm. know, if it's actually worth your time. Um, I think if I'm really, really excited about a project and, you know, maybe if it is something that I, that I believe in, for example, like, um, you know, I recently created an illustration for, my Burning Man camp, you know, and that was like a really great way for me to exercise and do some personal work, but mm-hmm. still, you know, help someone else out. And, you know, so I think different things like that, different projects like that, when it's pro bono, mm-hmm. makes sense. You know, mm-hmm. if YouTube is coming up to you and being like, oh, can you do this thing for me for free? Like, hell no, no. no, no. <laughs> you know. And, I, and I'm assuming like if YouTube were to approach you, mm-hmm. uh, this is all work for hire. Am I right? Am I wrong there? A lot of it is work for hire. I mean, at least on my end, um, I know that there's a lot of in staff illustrators in these companies. You know, it might be kind of a scenario where, you know, in the case of startups in particular, 
where they don't have a budget to have the staff illustrator there, um, then that's that's where I fit in. My fingers are crossed here that the pay is, comparatively speaking, with other industries, the pay is better because they are mm-hmm. capturing all of your rights. You are creating this thing and then giving it to them, and it's theirs. They own it. Yeah, they will do yeah. with it what they will. Uh, and so they're paying you not only for the art, but also for the rights to use it for whatever, wherever they want to use it. Mm-hmm. That's exactly how it works. Mm-hmm. So just to kind of like bring everything back, uh, mm-hmm. and remembering that sitting with us, uh, metaphorically is, is an illustrator who's mm-hmm. just maybe looking for a little bit of advice, you know, particularly folks who, you know, work in the kinds of styles, I hate the word style, but the kinds of styles that are now being utilized by Google, by Uber, by WeTransfer. I mean, we, we didn't even talk about WeTransfer, but I love what they're doing with their sort of visual visualization of, you know, with their branding. Mm-hmm. How do you, you know, approach the tech industry if you want to illustrate for them? That's a good question. I think you have to get yourself out there a good path for me is, you know, there's a lot of agencies that are that are working with a lot of these tech companies. If you can get the attention of an agency and they like you, that's a really good way to get ongoing projects. Go to lots of networking events, uh, like Designers and Geeks is a really good one. Uh, Cascade SF is a really good one. You know, they're all over like Eventbrite and go and network and talk to lots of people and introduce yourself and, you know, add them on LinkedIn and start a conversation with them. Yeah, things like that. (laughs) And uh, look them up on Google. Yeah, totally. To learn more about Crystal, visit crystallauk.com. If you enjoyed our conversation, please share it online, subscribe to the podcast, and leave us a positive rating and review. This helps us find new listeners, and on a personal note, it would be nice to know that the podcast is helping. Continue the conversation in the comment section of each episode at illustrationdepartment.com forward slash podcast. This podcast is produced by the Illustration Department, a global leader in online education for illustrators. Visit us at illustrationdept.com for class offerings, testimonials, the alumni showcase, and more. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.